very roots of evil, of negativity and singularity, including the ultimate form of singularity, which is how can This is a typical violence of information. It's violent because what happens there is a murder of the real, the vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. Welcome to this week's edition of the Machinic Unconscious Happy Hour with Cooper Cherry and Taylor Atkins, as always, sponsored by the People's Institute for Revolutionary Semiotics. Before we introduce today's discussion and our guest, we just want to mention we do have a Patreon account at patreon.com forward slash M-U-H-H. Consider dropping us a buck a month there, or if not, maybe even leave us an awesome review on iTunes. Today, Taylor and I are happy to welcome Cristobal Escobar to the show. Cristobal is a lecturer in screen studies at the University of Melbourne and film programmer at the Santiago International Documentary Film Festival. Today, we'll be discussing his 2023 book, The Intensive Image in Deleuze's Film Philosophy. Uh, Cristobal, thanks so much for joining us. I've been wanting to have you on for quite some time. It's just a pleasure to have you on to discuss your work on Deleuze's cinema work, and we're really excited for this chat. So welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, uh, Cooper and Taylor, for having me on board. I'm, I'm thrilled to be joining the podcast. And, and I must say, I've been listening to some of your episodes, and I would encourage everyone out there to check this out as well. There is, you know, Todd McGowan, Graham Harman, Claire Colbrook, who is, you know, a key seminal uh, Deleuzean, let's say, mm-hmm. an episode with Michael Hart, John Roth, who, by the way, was one of my maestros, let's say, here in Melbourne. <laughs> yeah, nice. I admire his approach to Deleuze, and like many of us attended his seminars in the philosophy school. So it's great to be joining that Australian, let's say, uh, right. contingent. contingent. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I've, I think... and I've just heard, I've just know that soon you will be having Elizabeth Gross and Brian Masumi as well, which is like amazing. So yeah, check it out. We do, and this is probably my fault, but we do try to honor the Deleuzians in our life. Sometimes they can be ignored or castigated <laughs> and disparaged. And in fact, we've had uh, several Australians and and I think some New Zealanders. I'm just trying to think. I mean, you mentioned John Rofe. Is Sean Bowden or was it Sean Bowden? Is it Bowden? Who's, I think, and gosh, uh, Simon Duffy was another. That's right. Uh, yeah, you yeah. mentioned Claire Colebrook. We've dealt with this time shift because it's to speak of the time image. You're you're <laughs> what fifteen hours ahead of us, maybe right, right now. Although we are we are all having mate apparently, right? So <laughs> right. On a Sunday, and you guys are on a Saturday evening. Afternoon. Saturday evening, afternoon. yeah, late afternoon. We're thrilled to have you on, and I think we warned you. We want to hear your origin story. So we we just heard that John Rofe was one of your teachers and he is a very, I can see that's a great teacher to have. It makes sense that he would have a, a broad audience and 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 have a lot of students. He's, he seems like a very genial guy and obviously super smart. But tell us a little bit about how you got into philosophy, theory, maybe how you got into the Luz and what drew you to the cinema books, which sometimes get left out of focus from a lot of other, I'm not just going to blame Deleuzeans, but a lot of just work that considers Deleuze. A lot of times it's anti-Oedipus, Thousand Plateaus, maybe a little bit of difference in repetition. A lot of times those cinema books can be missed. So yeah, tell us about this this origin story. I think everything is by accident in a way. First off, I'm, I'm not from Australia, I'm from Chile, and I arrived to Australia 10 years ago. And so I had to learn this kind of new language, which is mm. sort of a sec, you know, like a secret language to express myself differently. But, but growing up in Chile, in a way, philosophy, I mean, I never studied philosophy as such, and doing philosophy was always by other means. And, mm. and I guess what I mean by that is that, in my opinion, the best philosophers in, in South America are are poets, you know, filmmakers uh, sometimes as well. Think of the work of, you know, uh, Raul Zurita, 
in Chile, o Borges in Argentina, mm -hmm. Ricardo Piglia, or even in Mexico, Chicana, you know, Gloria Saldúa. What, what is that? Is that a philosopher? Is that a cultural critic? Is that a shaman? You know, you have always that intersections happening in the realm of thought. And, and I think that was what attracted me about the less philosophy more particularly, right? Because in a way, to me, it was always about doing thinking by different means. And that's mm -hmm. something that the Les and Watari clearly uh, develop in their latest collaboration, which is what is philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, and in a way, what they do there is like to reflect about the position, kind of the privileged position that the arts have, have occupied in what they do, you know, the aesthetic field. And what I like about that is that, in a way, what we call thinking, it's in a way monopolized by philosophy, right? Like we think of thinking in terms of what philosophers do. And conversely, what we call creativity is kind of associated with the idea of the arts, right? Mm -hmm. But what they get at, in my opinion, is that thinking and creativity are coextensive in life and it's not easily distinguishable. We cannot distinguish the domain of one from the others, right? In a way that philosophers, as much as artists, are said to experiment with, uh, you know, this idea of the unknown and, and to create the new. To me, poetry, cinema, and then, if you like, philosophy are ways of, you know, confronting this chaos. That's how I started to read the less in the first instance, was, wow, there, here is someone who has written a lot about philosophers, you know, it's a kind of historian of philosopher in, in, in his first, you know, period, yeah. but then becomes a kind of cultural critics who start thinking about painting through Francis Bacon, literature with Kafka, and then the cinema books, you know, he, mm -hmm. he becomes something different. And then, and towards the end with Felix Watari doing this kind of collaborations is, is something other completely, completely new, right? So that kind of... Uh, movement of thought was, I guess, what attracted me in the first place. But I said at the beginning was a bit of an accident or even mm -hmm. an anecdote, if you will, you know, and the first time that I encountered the list wasn't really through uh, his books or or through other the lessons. It, it was it was on a, in a newspaper. It was I was oh. reading an article about a Maoist who visited Michel Foucault in the 60s in France and you know, in this kind of conversation, he was saying something quite interesting, telling Foucault that these Maoists could, could perfectly understand, you know, someone like Jean-Paul Sartre in, mm -hmm. in that why Sartre is with us, the way he engages in politics and the way he does th that as well, you know. Then he, he adds, you know, I perfectly understand you, Foucault, quite well as well, in the sense that Foucault has always raised this issue of confinement and, you know, the shift from one, one type of society to the other, from the sovereign to the disciplinary to the, you know, kind of control society and so on. And then at the end, he adds, but Gilles Deleuze, that guy, I don't really get him, you know. And I really like that idea of the philosopher kind of that is who is always open to interpretation, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a kind of figure uh, that is quite heterodox in the French sort of philosophical circle of the time. So if we think of theory, for instance, you know, Deleuze would kind of early on distance himself from the kind of great H's of continental thought, like he doesn't write on Hegel much mm -hmm. uh, or Husserl or Heidegger, you know. Instead, he kind of favors a different H, which is that of Hume. So that was like, you know, here's someone doing something completely new in a way. And the same goes to the political sphere, which is quite controversial sometimes, you know, the fact that he never joined the Communist Party in France, right? And the same goes, you know, to the historical axis, you know, he never underwent psychoanalysis. It was, I guess, yeah, this kind of heterodox figure that really attracted me. So it was an encounter with an stranger, as someone mm -hmm. once mm -hmm. said. And yeah, so I then started reading more about his, I guess, biography before getting into the philosophy, philosophy books. And then I learned that even his death, in a way, continues to inhabit this dynamic terrain of interpretation, you know? I don't know if you, if, if you know that he, he died. I mean, he had this like severe 
respiratory failure and that he died in his apartment in Paris, um, pretty much because of the injuries that were caused by, by this emphysema, I think it's called. Exactly. He had tuberculosis and then a lung removed. Right. And then, yes, he developed these failing health. He had emphysema. It's interesting that for a long time, I always heard that it was suicide. And and then, <laughs> I, you know, talking to someone like Dan Smith made me rethink a lot of this more in detail about how in hospitals with lung with with patients with lung problems, pulmonary disease, you bar the windows or it's on the first floor precisely because opening that window, you're literally suffocating. You're it's, yes. it's just the kind of exactly uh, you have yeah. this strong will like to leap into the abyss. You're right. Like many, many interpret this act as a kind of as a suicide, right? And interestingly enough, some of these are the Lacanian specialists. That is, in a way, they say that it's quite common for these patients suffering respiratory problems to bint out and, you know, in some cases, even throw themselves out of the window in that kind of desperate attempt to get fresh air. So what I'm saying is that even his death remains open to interpretation. Although, like, if you start looking at the kind of French uh, sort of environment of the time, his death, which is quite tragic in a way, adds to the no less, you know, tragic deaths of the intellectual scene, you know, having mm. Foucault succumbing to AIDS in mm-hmm. war, I think, mm. Althusser's death in the 90s, in 1990, after, you know, kind of killing his his wife, um, right. or oh, suicide, and then 1995 is the time for the less, who Foucault actually calls him, I think, the sole, the only philosophical spirit of France, right? Mm. Mm-hmm. So there you have a philosopher, in a very stimulating milieu. I mean, sorry, I took the long the long road, but that's pretty much how I got nope. into, into Gilles Deleuze. And, and the other one was about, ah, well, about the cinema book. That's when I started reading more carefully Deleuze's books. I started with Capitalism and Schizophrenia and What is Philosophy? I really like What is Philosophy? Kind of to shape my relationship with this um, sort of a stranger, you know? Because what I noticed there is that they were not satisfied with the work that philosophy was doing up to sort of that time, in the sense that philosophy hasn't undergone like similar revolutions or experiments as those that were being produced in science at the time or in painting or music and literature, right? So what they they really trying to do there is to say, you know, we need a formal renewal. We are experiencing the problem of formal renewal, and that's totally possible. And I think that's that's why he was so interested in the other sort of arts, you know, as a yeah. kind of transdisciplinary sort of uh, thinker. And so that's when you start th- realizing that, you know, the medium in philosophy is the concept, like the sound would be the medium for a musician mm-hmm. or color would be for a painter, right? The, the philosopher, is the one who creates concepts. And so I guess because of this kind of transdisciplinary perspective is like his books were received with a lot of uh, enthusiasm, but also a lot of perplexity in mm. the early in France, you know, and, and that's probably because of these uh, conceptual relationships that were emancipating from kind of traditional ways of thinking about cinema, uh, but mm. also a dialogue that the two books establish with uh, filmmakers, how filmmakers, in a way, are thinkers having dialogues with philosophers. So for those who have read the books, you know, you will find Henry Bergson's idea of immanence, in a way, linked to the experiments of the new German cinema with Mm -hmm. uh, Benders, with Fassbinder, with Herzog, and then each of these filmmakers would correspond to a specific type of image and drawing from the expressionism of of German cinema. But then you have like someone like Hitchcock producing mental operations that is linked to Pierce's semiotics, Whitehead's uh, process philosophy, even though Whitehead is is not very much present in, 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 in Deleuze's books. There are some passages where you get this idea of a process philosophy, especially with Bertov's materialism, but then, you know, we can go and, and expand Leibniz with Renoir or the power of the false in Nietzsche with Orson Welles' 
F for fake, Murnau more, more universe with Kantian metaphysics. And so there you really have someone who is bringing different, different expressions of thought together by means of, of moving images. And so, and then the, the, the first problem, the, the first like line of the problematic in a way that I that it took me a while to understand was that was this idea of all right, let's do a book on cinema. You know, yeah. he wrote two books: the movement image and the time image. And then he says that if, as a philosopher, you know, I'm dealing with concepts, uh, but cinema's concepts, he says, are not given in cinema, but in right. philosophy, right? Because he's, the philosopher is the one who deals with concept. Cinema, on the other hand, is a kind of a new practice of we could say images or signs. And then it is that theory that philosophy must produce as a conceptual practice, right? Right. And so I like I really like this coupling between, you know, if you like the virtual and the intensive. We'll talk about that later, but sure. kind of the idea of thinking and, and sensation as a mode of, of creativity. And then, you know, you go a bit crazy when 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 you start kind of taking notes with these two very dense volumes and, and realizing that even though these are two books split into two main images or two main image categories, such as the movement image or cinema one and the time image cinema two. But you have more than, I think it's 44, at least more than 40 images or let's say concepts. Each of these images have their sign of composition. So it was like diving into this crazy taxonomy that really attracted me to start with, right? And that's how I developed my, my doctoral days and my PhD. So that was your thesis. This book is is a reworking of your doctoral thesis. Is that correct? Yeah, that that's correct. Okay, that's correct. And that's in, in, interesting too, because um, even though there are some sort of Ad Adelesian, let's say, community in Melbourne, I was very influenced by the psychoanalytical tradition, and so I was always, in a way, with my supervisors, let's say, who is a famous psychoanalyst, a, a film theorist, always kind of debating these sort of op oppositional realms of thought, right? And that was very stimulating yeah. for, the, for the end result. But Because uh, Deleuze but yeah. is, is, is kind of dismissive of the psychoanalytic <laughs> application to film. I mean, he even ends Cinema 2 by the very last sentence, kind of reminding us, like, look, applying linguistics or psychoanalysis to film isn't the way to go. It's interesting. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the swapping from Suser to Pierce to start with in the way mm -hmm. we categorize signs, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know if I was, it was by means of psychoanalysis that I also started to see a kind of duality in mm -hmm. the this taxonomical construction of the cinema uh, in the in the Les's book. And I thought, well, that's actually, well, it's something that other kind of contemporary scholars have also picked, you know, started with Jacques Rancière and his more kind of dialectical reading of, of films, among many others. But, mm -hmm. but I thought, what if we apply a concept that the less develops thoroughly throughout his books, that which is that of intensity, mm -hmm. and bring it into the cinema? What would happen if we inject this idea of intensity into the cinema books. And this is also a kind of anecdotal sort of evidence, as Sean Cubitt has it, in the way that I established my relationship with this thinker. You know, like the more I read about the less, especially his first like period as a historian of philosopher, I started to realize that he's always confronting other thinkings with his own kind of machinery, his own yeah, like yeah. system of thought, right? What really got me was the book on Kant, when he says that this is a book dedicated to, it's dedicated with admiration to an yeah. enemy. You know, that's fascinating. How can you <laughs> admire your, you know? And then again, conversely, if you read like Capitalism and Schizophrenia, Michel Foucault, who writes the pre preface, mm -hmm. says the new century is going to be the lesson. I never quite understood how to read that passage. Even though they were friends, it could have perfectly been a kind of irony to say, you know, that in the century that we are living right now, yeah. uh, it, you know, completely populated by rhizomatic structures that not necessarily lead us to more affirmative life forms, but actually way more oppressive in the sense of society of control and so on. But yeah, so that's, I guess, pretty much how I 
yeah, I got into this into the cinema books uh, by way of anecdotes and gossips as well. Uh? <laughs> Christopher, what translations did you read, or did you read in the French? Because we have heard, I think it's Dan Smith that kind of we've had on before a couple of times, and he was saying that the at least the English translations are not very good. Just kind of curious what your experience was. Did he, did he was. say that about the cinema books? I'm pretty sure that he said they were kind of a mess um, well, and not the best translations. The, Tim Conley, if you're listening, I'm, I'm sorry to say, <laughs> right. but the, the universally panned translation of The Fold is the one that usually gets right. disparaged. But I, um, it may not but have I, been him, but someone someone I mean, had that was Deleuze and was like, yeah, the, you know, the translations are not the greatest. I think yeah. it, what the translation is Hugh Tomlinson and the cinema one is Hugh Tomlinson and Barbara Haberjam, I believe. And yeah. then cinema two is Hugh Tomlinson and um, Renee Galletta or something yeah. like that. Maybe I thought that there were some interesting choices. I would have to look at the French to compare. I think they're fairly readable. But yeah, I mean, did you did you read Deleuze in Spanish translation first? Were you reading him in French? Were you reading him in English? A little bit of all three? Back to Cooper's question, I think that's a really important one. And I mean, I didn't have much issues reading the one in English. I mean, I think Spanish is closer to French, right? So that really gave me a different um, understanding, especially of the affection image, which in English kind of sounds different to what it is in, in the idea of affect, right? Right. But right. what is interesting about this game of translations is that you usually get all of the French translated immediately into Spanish, right? There is kind of a very intimate connection between the two cultures. Right. Whereas in English, it's really hard to find some of of even today, some of the lesser books. And one book that really made the difference, which is actually not a book, but a seminar, is the one that uh, the classes that the less run at uh, Vincenzo's in St. Mm. Denis from 1981 to 1985. You know, there are like these five sessions where he experiments and start kind of trying out some ideas about this connection between film and philosophy. And those have been translated to Spanish, uh, I think, at least a decade a ago. And that was a really valuable resource to thinking about the intensive image more specifically. Because even though you don't have much intensity in terms of the conceptual idea of intensity happening in the cinema books, the seminars at, at San Vincenzo's is populated by this idea of intensity, right? And discussions are, you know, intensive themselves. I know that you, Taylor, uh, have translated some some the less among other philosophers and i would you know recommend to have a look at those seminars in the french because it's a really important contribution to rethinking this almost duality or like taxonomy yeah. the movement image which was written in 83 halfway through the seminars and the time image which was written in 85 so at the right. end of the I haven't translated Deleuze, strictly speaking. I have translated, I just finished a translation that will also be from Edinburgh Press, just to plug them, because they published your book, <laughs> uh, by a, an Argentinian, Axel Chernyovsky. He published a book on Deleuze's creation of concepts and the notion of method in Deleuze. I think that unpacking what method Deleuze yeah. elaborates is really interesting. So I've, I've translated a... A work on Deleuze. But I do know that um, Dan Smith and Charles Duvall, they've been working at Purdue to get all of those seminars that are extant translated. And they as well have said, because when you first pick up the cinema books, it's very demanding. You know, as you said, there's a pro proliferation of, of these classifications and these this taxonomy. And then you have what? I mean, hundreds of films that probably yeah. aren't within the regular repertoire of contemporary, you know, you'd have to be a cinephile to recognize a lot of them. I do think that they said, and this is in agreement with what you just mentioned, that the seminars, the ones that are dedicated to cinema, which are extensive, as you, as you pointed out, is the right place to start in mm -hmm. order to get the most out of your experience of the cinema books without needing to immediately like reread them or really pour over them. So I would I would I would second that is looking at those seminars. And so that makes sense. It's interesting too because I haven't read all of them and I've only really those the cinema seminars I've only really like looked at a, a couple of them. One that I remember 
is Deleuze going deep into an analysis of Taxi Driver by, you know, Martin Scorsese. And I, I kind of love that movie. So I was really happy to, and he, and he mentions them in the books too, but he, he does a kind of a deep dive in one of the seminars. And so you can kind of see him, and he does this with the seminars a lot, where in his books, he's condensing down a lot of work that he's done extensively. And so to know that the notion of intensity is found in the seminars gives a little bit of information about where the genesis of your thesis comes from. And so that's fascinating. Exactly. So it has to do with translation at the end of the day, you know, and, and I would like to mention here Pablo Ires and the work that Cactus in, Arge in Argentina is, is doing, you know, they've been translating all of the lessons, seminars and, mm -hmm. and what are it, you know, and there are a few, I, I guess, available in English as well with uh, Francis Bacon, but there are so many, you know, from Bergson all the way up to the papers preparing what is philosophy. There's still a lot of, a lot of work to do in, in this realm. We'll have to go back and look about the questions <clears throat> of the, the translations yeah. of the cinema books. And um, maybe we'll ask Dan and Charles on or off right there, right yeah you know, what if they had mentioned that but that's that's a good question to ask and and it's, i mean when we looked at the kant lectures i thought they were far more mm. interesting i think than even the kant book that was published because i think we read right remember when we did the kant book we read at least yeah. a little bit of one of the lectures yeah it's yeah. interesting right there's the uh, there's a couple of things there where in French, you know, the Kant book is is very slim, but in English, they add on to it the uh, the little essay that he wrote, the four formulas, right, uh, about Kant, which is in Essays Critical and Clinical. So that's nice that in the English edition, you have that additional. There is a sense in which Deleuze's seminars give you a lot more, I don't know if it's the pace or if it's yeah. the breadth, but <laughs> you you don't feel like it's, and again, it's it's not so condensed. You can see a little bit more of the path instead of it being more of a beeline. You kind That's of right. see some of the the trajectory and the meanderings and the windings. So you can kind of suss yeah. out a little bit more what's going on. Yeah, I would encourage anyone who is interested in the less to go and the cinema books to go and have a look to those um, seminars. You know, I think you can get the audios in French at least on the internet, but what is really crucial in those classes is not just, you know, the less lecturing on the cinema books, but the, the conversations that he has with, right. you know, musicians, there are uh, poets, uh, architects, and everyone brings like their own kind of categories into the room. And, and so, you know, it's a very stimulating conversation. And that's, again, when, when I was sort of introducing this, how I got into philosophy or yeah. the less talking about poetry is that then, you know, I start seeing the same pattern happening in, in cinema and the relationship between cinema, for, say, and the written word, you know, like at the work of, of the novel. I think someone there in the, in the seminars mentioned that, you know, cinema in a way, I mean, if we take cinema as an art form, because it's mm -hmm. also an industry, and that's something that we could uh, expand True. on later. As an art form, cinema is a kind of antipode of literature. And the guy goes and says, you know, in the sense that literature is the art which grants visibility to the blind person. So if you think of, you know, when you read a book, when I read to my children, they don't need to see what I'm reading to visualize the story, right? Like it's created in your mind. So mm -hmm. a blind person can easily follow that cinematographism that is already contained in the novel, right? But then this guy adds, you know, and so if that's the work of literature, then cinema is the art which blinds the seer. That's probably a type of cinema. Not every single film does that. But and that's what we could call, I guess, like a film poem. If you follow like mm -hmm. uh, Maya, Maya Deren's definition of a film poem is something that creates visible and auditory forms for something that is invisible. You know, mm -hmm. and we could call that intensive or the feeling, the emotion, and even the metaphysical content of a moment, right? Something that is happening on a screen and you can't quite make sense of. That's when intensity gets into the discussion in this seminar, right? right? And that's when I thought, well, you know, here's something that we could do. And in a way, kind of 
I don't want to sound too arrogant with this, but in the same way that the less says, you know, this is a book dedicated to a, an enemy with admiration. It's kind of the same posture that I try to adopt with the less's taxonomy. It's kind of saying the only way that I can sort of truly honor this, you know, thinker is by introducing a bit of a bit of violence or a bit of, you know, yeah. kind of a bit of an inflection in his system of thought. And so you have like the gap. It's a very important category, the in-between images, the idea of time being out of joint and all of these metaphors pointing to the gap. But there is also, I thought, a gap in the way we think about the division between the two cinemas, right? And yeah, and that's everything is can be found in those seminars and not so much in the cinema books, right? So that's interesting. Just to ping off of you, what's interesting to me is you're indicating a gap that needed to be filled with mm -hmm. and 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 obviously just to let the audience know it's in your title the intensive image would fill that gap but at the same time it seems that you're also undermining the gap that Deleuze wants to so to speak mm -hmm. build between mm -hmm. the movement image and the time image so on the one hand you're filling a gap on the other hand you're you're showing how the the gap is maybe perhaps too emphasized that right. that interval is a little too emphasized by Deleuze. And so I guess that, you know, what one of the things that we could start with, right, you know, as you've already said, the two books, Cinema One, Cinema Two, Cinema One is devoted to the movement image and supposedly encapsulates, this is the historical part of Deleuze's argument, supposedly would be what he calls a kind of classical cinema, cinema, which he wants to kind of, I mean, for him, it's it's before the Second World War, before the end of the Second World War. But he also mm -hmm. even says there's a time lag, too, for different countries where in Italy, it might be 1948. In France, right. it might be 1958. In Germany, it might be 1968. And he's trying to look at conditions on the ground historically to maybe explain why Italy was at the forefront of developing the movement image due to its what it's it's kind of relation to World War Two and, and rethinking the continuity inherent in the movement image. That's obviously we can get to that later. But I'm just trying to point out for the listeners that what you're trying to correct or at least offer a kind of alternative vision to, as you say, slant Deleuze's kind of hard break between the classical and the modern or the movement image and the time image is this notion of the intensive image, which seems to show that the difference between the two is perhaps not as absolute. Yes. Did I encapsulate some of what you're arguing? Obviously, I didn't encapsulate everything, but I'm, I'm trying to like scratch the surface maybe. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I'm happy to go back to the sort of narrative structure of the cinema books um, yeah. as well, just kind of make it easier for, for the audience. But but I guess what you were saying at the start about filling this gap, it uh, it is also a very Bergsonian vocation in a way, because uh, this idea of duration that is very, very present in, 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 in the time image in cinema, in cinema too, uh, in French is uh, durée which means basically the, the concrete reality of time. And if there is something to time as this philosophical category is that in itself is continuous uh, and it, it lacks any kind of abstract measurement. And so I like that idea of time being that metamorphosis, the Elan Vital, Bergson's called it as mm -hmm. well. You know, stepping out of the cinema and thinking about our own lives, you know, it begins long before we are born, If you know, in the sense of time being this kind of realm in which we are all in. Time is our condition for action, right? Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Time doesn't end until well uh, after our death. So in a way, this breath of time that Bergson, Deleuze, and you know, many other philosophers discuss does not expire in, in our body. You know, It goes on forever to put on other bodies, masks, and so on and so forth, right? But despite this changing of, of bodies, we could say that we are all metamorphoses of the same life or the same time because precisely we are in time and time is what time is what i guess like creates those conditions of existence so that's something that is very clearly stipulated in cinema too but then i thought well what if and this comes from like live experience what if i start experiencing the same in supposedly classical films right right um, 
I'm sure that, I mean, in, in the 70s and 80s, when the Les started thinking about, about these ideas, I mean, he was like a cinephile, you know, he, he loved yeah. going to the movies, but probably at that time, you didn't have access to all of the films. There were important things happening outside of Europe and, and North America, you know, uh, even in, in the States, you had someone like Maya Deren that probably, I don't know, maybe they weren't aware of, like in, in France at the time, right? So when you start adding these kind of unknown voices into sort of the, the historicity of the cinema books, then you, you kind of start doing other things. Also, by re, rethinking about the, the categories that the less, is cre the less creates with someone like Buñuel, who lived, you know, big part of his life in Mexico, and the type of experiments that he was undergoing with surrealism. For someone like Pasolini, Buñuel inaugurates this tradition of film poetry that, mm -hmm. you know, cut across the history of cinema. And so if film poetry is this kind of films where intensity appears, then we have an issue with that kind of a structure of the of the movement image schemata. But maybe, I mean, maybe I can go back to to this kind of trajectory of, of the moving images and then I don't know, maybe land into this idea of intensity, right? Because that's the best way to really grasp I guess what what intensity is trying to to achieve in this uh, construction. By the way, I'm I'm not like I don't want to sound like an anti Deleuzian uh, in the way that they are in relation to psychoanalysis. I'm more of an a Deleuzian in the way that David Martin Jones defines himself, just like an a, a, as an another kind of Deleuzian writing on the less, but also someone who is using his constructions to take that idea somewhere else right of course there, there's no reason to try to remain faithful to what exactly the right. himself said where he i mean just as as you mentioned in what is philosophy philosophy is is no longer or should no longer be seen as sort of hierarchical in terms of thinking or the arts in terms of creation right there is this kind of again this rhizomatic non-hierarchical relation of contact it's the same thing where Deleuze shouldn't necessarily be the master of what we can unpack or what we can extend and learn from the uh, the, the theorizations he's doing. He, just because yeah. he may be a privileged voice to a certain extent, if we want to know what he thought, that doesn't mean that he necessarily sets the benchmark for what yeah. may make sense or ring more true or even more useful for for working through these things. But yeah, yeah I mean, like I, I was, I was fascinated by, well, we'll get to this, but one of the things that I was fascinated by was maybe why Deleuze wants to make this hard and fast mm. cut between the two in terms of a philosophical move in terms of the problematic of the image of thought, which we can get to. But I think first I'll let you take back over and, and go into this we can we can talk a little bit about the difference you know the, the main differences which i, I kind of wrote down which which he he recapitulates at the end of cinema too but yeah. the differences at least conceptually right between movement image and time image since we've talked about the the rough cutoff date if if 45 is kind of the cutoff date of the reign of that dogmatic image or the classical image of cinematic thought so we, yeah. we kind of understand his historical divide and he has he gives reasons for it, but at least that's helpful in a quick way. Maybe we can talk about the conceptual distinctions. I feel that we are never getting into the actual thing to discuss and going through the branches and, you know, taking the discussion to different directions, which I find fascinating. But I was I want I just wanted to add, uh, Taylor, that don't you think it's kind of strange to have this book about two images kind of clearly linked to different historicities in a kind of philosophical project. If you look at the less larger project mm -hmm. where everything mixes with everything else. I right. know I know Les is always thinking of his works as like singularities, right? And the singularity is something that we can discuss later as well. But there is something alien about the, the construction of the cinema books that again, you don't find yeah. in the seminars, right? I guess that that was the first kind of problematic that I wanted to follow. But then it gets even more difficult when mm. the less states early on that, you know, this is not a book about the history. It's not about the history of the cinema, 
but it's about a natural kind of a natural conception of the moving image. And mm -hmm. so the first problem with this book, which is really, really strange, is the definition of the image. You know, what is an image? So we already know that the concepts that the less is developing do not come from the cinema, but from philosophy. But then the way he's thinking about images is not as as we could, you know, as we would say with the kind of platonic tradition, representations. They right. could also be presentations of life in themselves. And so he says, you know, an image is, what's the definition that he takes from Bergson? It's like a slide, it's a, a slice of the universe, mm. right? It's a slice of the universe. So we are dealing with matter in itself. And that's a very Bergsonian conviction, uh, the idea of images being matter. So images are collections of sensations, right? They are like sensible aggregates. And I guess what is interesting about that thinking of the image is that sensations possess the capacity to sort of derange the everyday and to change the way we think. And that's the philosophical project behind the Les's cinema books, in my opinion. And so I guess if the image is no longer a representation of an object or a like visual impression, as we would traditionally think, then we start looking at the cinema or, or the images we see uh, on screen as an encounter with a reality that we must evaluate. I think it's Berson who says in um, Matter and Memory, what happens when we open our eyes, say, I don't know, in the morning, uh, when we get up, you know? And he says, here I am in the presence of images. This is like in the vaguest sense of the word. Images yep. perceive when my senses are open to them and unperceived when they are closed. <laughs> Although, you know, we could argue that, you know, the best images are those that you create when you have your eye closed as well, you know, mm -hmm. like the dream images. But anyway, what, what he's saying there is that these images, when we open our eyes, start acting and reacting upon one another, you know, in all their different parts and according to a sort of a law that he calls the law of nature. Right. And so that's really the, the introduction to this natural taxonomy of images, which are slides of the universe. And that's when the kind of division, when the knife started kind of cutting all of these different forms of matter that the cinema produces. Right. And again, I'll, I'll go back to this later, but intensity, if you follow, you know, someone like Elizabeth Cross, definition following the list as well is the realm of the sensible, you know, intensity mm. is the category that belongs to matter itself, which is, I mm. think is so important to think about images as intensive, right? If we go back to sort of this organization of the cinema books, we, we, need, to, we need to remember that the two main things here are movement and time, right? And this is what the less following Berson calls indirect and direct representation of time. So you have Indirect representation in the classical cinema and then direct representation in the modern cinema. To give a bit more of enthusiasm and, and encourage people to read the cinema books, uh, which are great, actually, uh, is to say that it's actually, you know, if you follow the structure of these two books, like the story arc, if you will, is very classical in its narrative organization. The books begin with kind of a state of nature, uh, mm -hmm. which is followed by its fall and a subsequent resurrection, you know? It's very, very kind of Christ Christian as well. Yeah, it, okay, yeah. In that regard, let alone that, you know, it's highly influenced by the, by the, the, the writings of André Bazin in France. What you have there is that there was once a cinematic image that was adequate to the expression of the time that then fell into crisis. And this is what he calls the shattering of the movement image system, you know? So it falls into crisis and then it resurrects as a new image, which he calls the time image. And this is an image that is adequate again to a new time, even though this new time is a time of loss, is a time of disjunction. You know, this is the time of the gap that we were talking before mm -hmm. and a time of, of decay. So first act, cinema one, Last act, cinema two, and then you have a middle act that comes in the transition between the two books that you were pointing out earlier, Taylor, in relation to neorealism in Italy, especially 
Rossellini and uh, Germania and Otsero, but then you also have someone like Bresson in France and Hitchcock. I mean, Hitchcock is a really important filmmaker that comes at the end of the cinema one and then sort of recapped in at the beginning of, of cinema two. Hitchcock is kind of that filmmaker who is at the juncture between the two cinemas. And the less describes Hitchcock, I believe, as a liminal director. That's that's how, maybe that's my, my translation, but the idea of a liminal director in the sense that he brings into completion the movement in the image to make room for a direct presentation of time in cinema, right? Right, he's on the threshold and... Uh... And and even Deleuze says, you know, he may have wanted to, to like perfect the movement image and didn't realize that, in fact, as you said, gave rise to the conditions of possibility for the movement image. Exactly. It, that's right. And if we think of Deleuze's kind of preoccupation with time, this is exactly the filmmaker who is one of the first to be qualitative in time, you know? Like the idea of, if you look at Rare Window, you know, like mm -hmm. the, he's paralyzing his characters, the, like the uh, Jeffries, the main protagonist. Mm -hmm. uh, and through that character opens the image and the audience really to kind of a chain of relations that he calls the mental image. The idea that it is the filmmaker, I mean, sorry, the audience, which is, who's starting to, to make all of these mental connections. Is it true that what happened? Is it not? And so on and so forth. And so, and this is clearly in opposition to that kind of chain of actions, perceptions, and affections that were populating the cinema, according to the, to the less at to that point. If we go and dissect the movement image, you will find many other images within the system of, of classical cinema, you know, that he calls the sensory motor schemata. And the six key type of movement image are the perception image, the affection image, the impulse image, the action image, reflection image, and relation image. And each of these are related to one specific filmmaker or filmmakers. The perception image, for instance, we could link to the long shot as right. well. Mm -hmm. Perception image is very much discussed in terms of the of the close-up, what Bela Vassas calls the face, right? Mm -hmm. What happens when the screen becomes a face? You are able to investigate with careful detail all of those expressions coming from, he calls it the human face, but we could talk up nowadays, you know, in contemporary cinema as the landscape being a face with the films by James Bennings, for instance, right? And so on. But anyway, so you have that affection image and then you have the motor force of classical cinema, which is the action image. Yeah. And that's associated very much with the mid shot. This is what works like a kind of the organic structure. Classical cinema being organized by rational cuts and these rational cuts between images, determining the cohesive, cohesiveness of the film as a whole. This is also called a continuity system in cinema studies, right? Which is why the cinema books as a whole are so classically narrative composed. You know, you have like a state of nature, you introduce the characters, there is a crisis, and then, you know, there is kind right. of a finale. Well, not necessarily with a happy ending in this case, but <laughs> it's quite uh, uh, horrific. So again, yeah, I think... In the book early on, you start seeing this, the importance of the question of time, you know, what is the relationship between the movement image and time? And how is that in such a system, time uh, arises, right? And again, you know, this is a work that is highly influenced by the teachings of Bergson. And the less following Bergson argues that early filmmakers up to, you know, the mid 40s represent time in an indirect way. So this means basically that move, the movement of classical action predetermines time in a series of movements in a space, which is blocking the energy, the intensity of the image, let's say, from becoming inventive or free to move in multiple directions. I was thinking of a metaphor that Bergson uses, not the less though, but in Creative Evolution, at the end of the book, Bergson briefly discusses this idea of the image puzzle. You brought that up in your book. That's fascinating. Right. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's a, a good way to illustrate how the movement image system is organized, is using the image puzzle not to create a figure, 
in time, but to reconstruct a picture that is already present before the assembling of the puzzle. Right. right. The pieces of the puzzle are already exist outside of any relation, right? They're they're partes extra partes, so to speak. Exactly. Right. And so and yeah, I, they're I external. Right. And it's I guess that sort of that experience in cinema of anticipating future events, let okay. alone knowing that probably there will be a happy ending at the end. No? So you can rely on that sort of emotion, that things will go all right, you know, kind of that moral teaching. Uh, that's also another way of thinking about the classical cinema in Deleuze's construction that is highly moral. You know, it's always giving you a motto uh, and so on. And Deleuze, I guess, translates this idea of the image puzzle as the schemata. But I was also wondering if, this could also be a case for that dogmatic image of thought. That... Yeah, or an orthodox image. Okay. Instead of a paradoxical image, it's an orthodox image. It's common sense and good sense are kind of organizing the relations. It's not yet time out of joint. Time is still kind of in joint with the rationality of, of the cuts. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. And I think in, can't remember what chapter, but... In Cinema One, he talks about, you know, he says there is anything else or anything more than there is in the image, in the classical image, because that image and the perception of, of the image that we are seeing are one and the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. So that's very much, yeah, like kind of platonic in that regard. And I think one key, I guess, genre or filmmaker there is, well, Griffith. And we could also extend it to John Ford, if you like, with with a film like, um, what's the, the, forgot the name of the film. Anyways, but you know what Ford does with the American Western, the North American Western, is to invent what the less calls the modify image. This is part of the action image, but he calls it the modify image. So you have an image which is shown twice. For example, in this film, What's Let the look, name? Let me see if I can look it up. Uh, let's see. We got with um, with see, Uncle Ethan, one of his greatest film. Anyway, you have there like this modified image where you show it once at the start of the film when Uncle Ethan arrives at the center of the screen, kind of controlling the milieu, and then is modified or completed in such a way at the end by showing the same image, but even though it's the same image, you feel there is a difference between the first situation and the last situation. The Searchers, that's the name okay, of the film. Okay, I, I just looked it up, so yeah, you, I was, so, I was gonna, uh, but you, you already the, remembered it. In the yeah. Searchers, you know, you have like John Wayne, who always plays John Wayne in, in his films, being Uncle Ethan. And, you know, he arrives to town, then, you know, he goes for the quest and chase the criminals and then mm -hmm. comes back. And you have the same image at the start and at the end of the film, right? So that's another way of thinking how in classical cinema, you have this idea of the star, you know, the Hollywood star. That's something interesting because the star is right. something into kind of the celestial realm, something that is in control of everything. Right. Uh, Giorgio Agamben discusses this idea with the Italian Divo in cinema as well. And Divo as well comes from this idea of divinity. This kind of stars at the center of, of action. But then it's also about, if you think of the Western as an action image, it's also about the shooting and reshooting of the same single film. And that's what the less, the less discusses with Griffith as someone reshooting this fundamental film, which is the birth of a nation civilization. Mm. But also in Griffith, you find this idea of the Aristotelian cinema in terms of like that organic montage that is cohesive, is highly rational, if you, if you like. But it's also organized in terms of, the less calls it an organism, a great organic unity. And this great organic unity is composed of contraries or, you know, uh, oppositions which work as organizing principles. So the rich and the poor, north and south, for instance, especially mm -hmm. in the U.S., uh, mm -hmm. white and black. Male, female, exterior, interior. You know, if you look at uh, the searchers, I've always thought that John Ford has a great capacity to show to shoot the exteriors. But there is something happening in the interior that is completely different to what you mm. experience when mm. the cowboys are riding their horses. But anyway, like the Western, if you think as a as a film gender, is is highly composed by these 
contraries that uh, or that organize its colonial standing as well, right? Mm-hmm. You always have the law of the book brought by the settler, the white colonizer, mm-hmm. and the law of the harpoon in something like Nanook of the North, for instance, right? That's, I guess, like a genre that would help you to visualize better how the movement image is organized. But if we bring this back to philosophy, because mm-hmm. again, his concern is with philosophical categories, is that if we think of the Hollywood star or the Italian Devo or any classical kind of hero, what the less is saying is that the I appears as the, the center of the actions. I appear to myself as the immobile center of my actions. And therefore, this means that the world appears curved around me, right? I'm in control of the situation, like the spectator being this projection sort of of the male white protagonist, which is something Mm -hmm. that Laura Mulvey has criticized greatly. And so I guess what happens in terms of movement then is that it appears to be relative to this to this fixed center or at least apparently fixed center, which is the central character. And so by interlocking this primacy of action in a firm system of events, what the less is accounting for is what we were discussing previously in terms of the dogmatic image of thought, right? Mm-hmm. And as you mentioned, uh, Taylor is kind of a rational consciousness that is sure of itself and the world it inhabits. And that's exactly what is forever broken with the second book, with the cinema of the time image. We read... Virilio's War and Cinema, and then we read Claire Colebrook's Who Would You Kill to Save the World? And in reading those, I kind of developed, I don't know if it's a real concept or maybe it's just even regurgitating the dogmatic image of thought in just different words. But I kind of, what you were just saying about kind of that sort of the primacy of the eye per se, I was calling the cinematic ontology. And there's some passages in your book that I thought lent themselves to that, but I don't know, I just wanted to kind of throw that out there because that really for taylor too that sounded exactly kind of what i was sort of thinking when i say cinematic ontology i mean i I do think that at least it's a traditional cinematic ontology right maybe that's what you mean by cinematic ontology is that it's it's this kind of traditional image of the way in which a movie and it's still it's still done today we we know that the hollywood blockbuster is something that Deleuze himself kind of criticizes yeah. gently, uh, but it's it's still the the main mode of big budget productions where this type of classical image, this movement image, whereby time is subordinated to movement and not yet kind of let loose, if you will. I think maybe that's what you are getting at with that phrase, cinematic ontology. Yep. That it, that it would be a traditional image of perhaps, yeah, of um, the cinema. First of all, you even s- describe it as like this, like view from like this transcendental view from on looking downward or something like that was yeah. the phrase. I don't know. I'm not sure. It's something that I'm kind of hashing out. So I, I don't know what you were saying about the primacy of the eye and sort of every the sort of universe or world, maybe even yeah. being curved to that space yeah. is something that I don't know, just stood out as what I resonated, let's say, with my notion of cinematic uh-huh. ontology. Absolutely. I mean, it's yeah. a, a fascinating, a very, a very problematic concept as well to think of an ontology. And and shouldn't we also extend ontology to time, the time image as well? And right, there yeah. is a sort of a, a rupture or like a, a metamorphosis with that ontology. And I think it's interesting, especially for the cinema books, because the less is also very influenced by the writings of André Bazin, who is like a film critic. And he calls, you know, he's not very He's not very optimistic about, I mean, or how can I put it? He calls Bazan as a philosopher. He calls him a philosopher rather than a film critic. I think that, you know, most of the best works on cinema come from film critics. You have the, you know, the writings of Adrian Martin today, also from Australia, that are terrific. But but anyway, the idea of ontology is very much implicated in the Bazinian image, the idea of indexicality, the relationship of the image with reality itself. Mm -hmm. And that's something that has brought into attention again in contemporary thought with someone like Tiago de Luca by thinking about the digital cinema or the digital era that we are in. You know, what happens with that indexicality when the images are no longer analog 
to the material, right, yeah. especially in relation to the lesser's definition of the image as, as matter as such. What is interesting, though, is that through digital technology, you get for the first time these massive works of, you know, of long duration, someone like the Russian Ark by uh, Sukurov that was right, shot right, entirely right. on digital, the works by Pedro Costa these days, or even like uh, Lucretia Martel's Sama, also on digital, works that are way more realistic, you know, in brackets, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. than the pioneering neorealist works, you know? That's a very interesting way of framing the cinema books as a yeah. question of ontology. And it is actually Basin, Bazan, sorry, who says that modern cinema stands in opposition to the kind of traditional dramatic system of action. And this is a cinema that rejects any type of analysis, whether political, moral, psychological, or social, of the characters and their situations. And that's very close to what the less is doing in the cinema books, right? It's almost like a, a tribute to Bazan's work on what is cinema, also split into different volumes. So I wonder to what extent the, this idea of splitting the cinema into cinema one and mm -hmm. cinema two comes also from, from Bazan. But the problem is that I don't see the larger work of the less contain or the idea of intensity to be more precise containing that division. I think that it would be way more interesting to think of cinema as this elan vital, as this constant metamorphosis, especially in relation to the tradition of film poetry and thinking about a kind of continuity. But I guess if we stick to Deleuze's like, ontology, what he's looking at is the, the shattering, as he calls it, of the, of the sensory motor schemata in the modern image. And so these new images are produced with no longer with attention to cause and effects logics or this kind of continuity system. By doing that, by opening the gap in between images, cinema is able to extract the features of time on their own terms, which are no longer required to the requiring, sorry, no longer subjected, I guess, to the uh, requirement, requirements of action. This is, you know, what Taylor was saying before in terms of the European crisis, crisis of the Second World War. There is something with the Holocaust that happens there, that there is no longer a harmonious relationship between, uh, you know, humans and the world, which is why you, you are no longer able to present, to dare to think of happy endings, you know. The world is a terrible place to live, and therefore cinema needs to connect with that, that kind of sensitivity. But it's also a crisis that you start seeing in the characters themselves of this new cinema. Mm -hmm. So just to give you a few examples, like if you think of um, Bergsman's persona, where, you know, you have Liv Ullman playing Elizabeth Vogler, and Elizabeth Vogler there is an actress. So an actress, uh, an actor playing an actor, who goes mute on a stage because something terrible has happened in the world that she's in. She goes mute and then she develops this kind of relationship with O Alma, which means soul in a kind of countryside, a beach house and so on. But then you also have the same sort of shattering of, of reason, if you like, in Fellini's Eight and a Half. Guido Anselmi, the Italian actor plays, I mean, the Marcello Mastroianni plays Guido Anselmi, uh, and again, Anselmi in this film is a filmmaker, another, let's say, artist who is unable to complete the film that, that he's making in the film. Again, you know, this kind of crisis that is commanding or kind of opposing the smooth actions of characters blow up again in Antonioni's film. Thomas, I think it's called The Protagonist. Um, he's a photographer, another artist who no longer is no whether he's witnessing a scene of a murder. So there is confusion. So what Deleuze says, not in relation specifically with these films, but more broadly, is that the modern characters become lost wanderers. So this is people who no longer know how to react to the uh, post-war world in which they, they live. And so there is a very, a very interesting link between cinema and, and war. Like in the North American New Wave filmmakers, which comes a little later, you could also relate that to the traumas experienced in the Vietnam War with, you know, like Kubrick's uh, full metal jacket. 
for instance, and even like the necessity to get tough on on drugs to kind of cope with the reality that you've experienced there. You have like Coppola's apocalypses now. But there is so many other ways of thinking about this crisis in terms of like youth disaffection with Bonnie and Clyde, or I think some of you were mentioning taxi driver before, you know, what happens with those psychotic disorders uh, that are commanding the story? You know, we, we become the protagonist, but the protagonist is no longer able to see the world and things clearly, right? And probably my favorite in that tradition, uh, Casavets, with a film like Shadows from the late 50s, you have all of those emotional struggles and ways of framing that are very experimental almost like deframing sort of faces and the movement of the camera and so on. The key point here, I think, is again, that these are all expressions of a life that is confronting the individual with kind of unresolved dilemmas rather than ready-made solutions. And that's, to me, the, the, the key distinction between, between the two cinema. And again, just as the less does in the movement image. Also, the time image contains many other kind of sub-images, if you will. And one that I that I really like, and I didn't have kind of the time to expand on, but many other contemporary Delesians have been working on this image, is the crystal image. And I know this is something that we could discuss in terms of the contemporary that that is present in, in, in my book. as The crystal image is this kind of, this image that shapes time as a two-way mirror, if you like, that is constantly splitting the present into two different directions, one which is launched towards the future and the other one which is launched towards the past. And so the time, the direct representation of time is that split. Deleuze says, says, you know, it is time what we see in the crystal. I mean, I could think of a film like The Pearl Bottom by Patricia Guzman. I don't know if you've seen it, which is very much a film about memory, a film about the memory of, of Chile, of his country, that is glimpsed into this quartz crystal that we see early on in the film. That's the, the first shot. And then you start to realize that this is a memory force. It's a force that connects everything in the film, from the starts to, you know, human life and their shared materiality by looking at the memory of water and how water, the Pacific Ocean in Chile, knows things that no one else does. So it's about, you know, the killings of, of the dictatorship as well in the, in the Pinochet era. But anyway, so that idea of, of the crystal image is this notion of durée or the élan vital of, or, of time as being a constant development of the same of the same image or the same kind of force, right? I guess as a concluding remark, and this is what Deleuze mentions in the cinema book as well, is that at the moment that the cinema stops subordinating time to motion, when it makes motion dependent on time, then the cinematic image becomes a time image, right? And that's, as Taylor mentioned before, what happens around the 40s and 50s in Europe. So you have Europe, you have North America, but you don't see much other sort of um, continents, right? The less talks about the missing people, the people to come in relation to African cinema, to some of Latin American cinema as well. But that's also an interesting gap, you know, an empty space that could change the way the books are classified, mainly by, you know, the first cinema of Hollywood, of the industry, even though you are, he also discusses the work of, you know, the Soviet school of montage or the French school as well, German expressionism and so on. But it's basically a response to the classical system of, of Hollywood, of first cinema. And then European cinema becomes this kind of second cinema of the petite bourgeois and all these artists that are undergoing crisis in the films that I mentioned before. But there is also a third cinema, you know, like, like the writings of Solana in, 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 in Latin America, which is a cinema that is confronting precisely those fixed demarcations and it's a cinema that is opposing to the idea of, I guess, the industry and kind of welcoming cinema as an art form. There has been quite a few critics of the less work, especially from 
the mid 90s, early 2000s onward in the cinema studies realm, I guess David Borwell would be the main uh, voice, especially because what he says in, in very simple words is that, you know, that kind of closure of the of the movement image in classical cinema is not present in, in Soviet montage films. These are films that, according to him, are often refusing to demarcate scenes very clearly. Or, as I do in, in the book, is not present in art cinema narration or poetic cinema, uh, and especially in Buñuel's surrealism or naturalism, where there is always like an ambiguous interplay of objectivity and subjectivity of different characters. There has been a lot written on the less on, sorry, Buñuel as well. Sheffer's book, The Ordinary Man of Cinema, which was recently translated to English, is a wonderful work on early monstrous images taking you know Buñuel among others like Keaton and the horror kind of tradition George Bataille dedicated a beautiful sort of review poem to Anshen and Dalle and he calls it kind of a cannibalistic image or something that you can never quite bite it's always escaping the realm of representation and and is Interesting that if you think of Onche and Bataille's book came pretty much the year, the following year, I think. A book which is also about an eye that changes from character to character. You know, Ronald Barthes had written a beautiful text about that film. And I feel that at least with Onche and you also see an eye that is jumping from one character to another and therefore making it very difficult to create that kind of taxonomy. But I guess if we go to philosophy, the main voice or critic of the list would be, in my opinion, uh, Jacques Rancière and, and, and Alain Badieu. I guess Rancière takes from sort of Badieu that critique, uh, the, mainly the disagreement with the less on this epistemological, but also historical division between the two images. So for someone like Rancière, I guess, what is more interesting is to think that these two logics of the image are contained within the same image. So we only have one image that compresses both logics of the cinema. And they call these two images the material sensu sensual and the intelligible spiritual. And so he's kind of accounting for a more dialectical relationship to film history, which is also something that many contemporary scholars are doing. So if you think of the work of uh, Ramona Fotaide or Lucia Nagib or Daniel Fairfax, Susana Viegas, they are all looking at these continuous images that cuts across the two cinema books. And that's when I want, or at least where, where I intend to make my intervention with the intensive image across these two periods. And it's an image that adds to that continuity argument. But I do so particularly because of the importance and the significance that, I guess, the less pays to this concept of intensity, right? If you want, we can start talking about the intensive image, which I haven't mm -hmm. expanded on. Quite. I, yeah, I, I have a quick sidebar, maybe, because you mentioned a film that I think is maybe not so interesting in terms of its content, but in terms of the way that it was shot. And that would be Russian Ark, because for Taylor and the audience, this is a film that was one long take. As far as I know, this is one of the only, if not maybe the only time this has ever been done. I know that Birdman from Inoritu also mimicked, one. mimicked this, the way that there were a few, cut. I think three or four or five, I don't know some number of cuts, but I don't know. I think that's kind of interesting and maybe even perhaps disambiguate. You might have already done this, but so I apologize if I'm repeating a question, so to speak, would be to maybe disambiguate where would a film like Russian Ark that is this single shot, where would that fall within these kind of image concepts for Deleuze? I haven't thought about that in terms of like the intensive image, but that's probably, you know, the model of this idea of durée as well. Because, you know, if you thought like there is... Pasolini, who writes on, I mean, and Pasolini is really important for the less idea of direct representation of time. But Pasolini says, you know, the cut in cinema is death. And it's the same in life, you know, the cut as embodying the moment when we no longer are in this realm. And so if we go back to that metaphor of the less and, and metamorphosis, he speaks about the theater where, you know, 
the characters dominate the individuals, right? So our roles dominate our being, but the space, the theater itself dominates those characters. And so in a way, this theater is, it does, does not have any beginnings and it will never end. It continues forever and it's always changing sort of masks. And so a film, a single film shot in, in, in one single take really expresses that idea of, of life, of time. So what happens when we introduce the cut? That's the importance of the irrational cut in modern cinema, because it's no longer establishing a relationship between the previous and the and the following image, but it's actually, you could even take every sequence as a film in itself. And so I'm not very good at mathematics, but if you think of a film as composed by many different takes, or one long take, if we go to the rationale, then a take is a summation of images. So you have film, a summation of takes, a take, a summation of images. But then the image is a summation of energy or matter or light, if you like, right? Right. So what happens, we always have these divisions within films, within the history of cinema, but in these divisions, there is also a continuity. So when I watch a film, I'm actually watching a thousand films if the film is composed by a thousand shots, right? And that's something that someone like Raul Ruiz, again, a filmmaker that was close to the less actually in the 80s in France, is trying to do with his system of images and sounds. So I guess, again, uh, the Russian arc would be a very interesting case to expand on this notion of intensity and the cinema, especially it, because, yeah, yeah, sorry. No, 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 you're, you're, gonna, you're about to say something yeah. important, so yeah. you finish your thought. Yeah, especially because like this idea of intensity, which I take from the less uh, philosophy and especially his previous books up to difference and repetition, is that it's an image that is based on the primacy of, of difference and sensation, right? And this is the image that I'm trying to locate in many different films. I mean, from the avant-garde to the poetic to the surreal and the more experimental, but films that are present pretty much from the silent period to our contemporary epoch. And so if we think of intensity in this way, we should also think of the concept as the kind of genetic or like the morphological force that animates and the cinema and the less cinemas more specifically. So it's an image that unites both images and they're one escalating form of difference. So this is what I call intensification, that the cinema, it's, you know, as, as an image that it evolves, it's always get, getting more and more complex. And again, that's also very much kind of embedded in Bazin's writing. You know, he has this chapter on the evolution of the language of cinema where he says, you know, the greatest films will be those composed of 90 minutes of a life of a man. He says we could add, you know, a woman or a cyborg or an animal or a landscape even. The life of this entity to whom nothing ever happens. So, I mean, one way of thinking about that is like one long take, as in the Russian art, but right. you can take the argument more in a more robust way and think of contemplative cinema or the slow kind of cinema, as they call it today. A film like Vitalina Varela by Pedro Costa is a manifest of that denarrativization and what Bazan calls the evolution of the language of cinema. But that is precisely the type of image that I also see in very early works of poetry. I'm thinking of, just to give you an example, I mean, you could even think of all the different movement image in, in the less taxonomy, the reflection image in Mitsogushi, or the affection image in Dreye, a work like The Passion of, the, of Jean Arc, which is made in 1928. You know, that is a work of, of course, of about the close-up or the extreme close-up that relates to the expressive powers of affection, as the less calls them. But it also relates to an image face, that of Maria Falconetti, the, the actor, that disconnects the face from the film as a whole. And if you've watched it, it's kind of an experience, a, a film experience that takes us to a completely different realm, a new physical, material, and also emotional realm, right? And so 
I don't think this is a film that can follow the unified schema of classical movement, right? There is a preponderance of sensation over the film's narrative logic, which is creating what we could say a space of tactile value, right? This is what Deleuze calls the any space whatever, you know, spaces that are disconnected from, in this case, the film as a whole, right? And so Maria Falconetti's close-up is intensive, right? Uh, it is a fragmented phase, is very much like the frame, you know, if you've seen it. And those the framings of her face are kind of breaking with that general economy of the movement image film. So it ways goes beyond the demands of dramatic characterization. It's actually fragmenting the film as a whole, right? So there you have an example of an early intensive image. It could be others. It could be Buñuel. Um, it could be later on Maya Deren in the States from a more experimental, poetic film tradition. But it's also about the concept of intensity as such, which I'm interested, you know? It is so important to the list. Every single book that he's written, intensity is there somehow. And I was like struck by the fact that you don't have the intensive image in the cinema books, which is why I started yeah, thinking about developing this concept, right? They even mention in some of the interviews with uh, Raymond Belleur, for instance, that you know, you will always have this intensity image or image intensity complex. And what is key for them is the fact that intensities are non-representative. These are images that deterritorialize or they break up any type of territory. And so if there is one argument in the book, and really an argument is very difficult to make most of the time, having ideas is a very rare event, as the list says is the argument or the intervention is basically to say that the, if there is something like an intensive image, it's also able to break up the lessest divide between classical and modern film by recognizing this, this activity of intensity as a potency, as an effective power that is able to bring all the periods together. And so... I started to take notes, you know, in A Thousand Plateaus, you have the lesson what are you saying? Everything has to be interpreted as intensity. Or if you go back to his masterwork from 68, Difference and Repetition, he says, you know, we only know intensity as already developed within extensity. Extensity. Okay. So then you have another, another category there to discuss as well, which is that of the extensive, right? Where the intensive is this idea of difference or images that cannot be perceived or captured in what we are actually seeing, extensity becomes the image as such. And that's another huge problem. How can you speak of an intensive image if intensity in a way is almost the opposite of an image? And I'm right. thinking, and saying image here, like for instance, when you read a book, images don't come when you are reading. They, they actually come afterwards, right? This idea of the of the capturing of an of matter, the capturing of a sensation, you know, images reduce the affective experience in a way, and that's what Deleuze calls uh, the extensive. Um, and so, what I'm saying is that if there is something like an intensive image, is precisely when you are confronted with those films that you cannot quite make sense of. When they ask you, all right, so what is this film about? And you have no, I, I mean, you are unable to give like a synopsis, but it, right. because it's not about necessarily about the, the conflict or the main, you know, argument of the story. It's more, it's more about the, the, yeah, the sensations that the, the, the film leaves with you. That's another thing to say about narration, you know, because at least in, 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 in English, we tend to say narrative cinema as opposed to counter narrative cinema, right? We could make that distinction as well, say, you know, one is about narrative, the other one is about non-narrative cinema even. But I don't think that's quite the case. I mean, cinema is presents a narrative in itself. Everything is narrative in the cinema. And the conflict of the story is only one of the elements of narration. But when you think of cinema as this amalgamation of images and sounds, then you can create completely different cinematographic experiences, you know, going back to Maya Dern. It's about 
capturing the invisible, the affective, the feeling, thinking of what is happening in that moment. And so intensity somehow points to that experience, which is, again, a pre-personal form of perception. It is when percepts inhabit your mind, which are not quite perception just yet. So in other words, it could denote a multiplicity, if you like, something that cannot be captured or apprehended in the mind as, a, as an image unit. You don't know what's what's that, you know? You don't have an image in a way. So intensities are always felt, you know? These are images that pass, deterritorializing, images that interrupt our sort of field of audio vision. And so it's a very, it's very familiar with the time image convention in a way, right? An image whose plurality or multiplicity always appears to present us something like an impression that is not yet represented, right? So it's more about presence than representation. And I guess that's something, yeah, again, that Deleuze and Watari discussed with uh, Raymond uh, Ballieu in some of their late interviews, you know, by saying that intensities are always draining images. It's a flux of images. They look at Godard, for instance, among other filmmakers. So, yeah, that's pretty much where my interest for intensities come from. And so if there is one hypothesis is that, or maybe a second hypothesis or research question, if you like, is that why, if the less writes so much about intensities, he doesn't propose the concept of the intensity much in cinema. So on top of adding to this continuity argument made by many contemporary philosophers and film scholars, my intervention is about thinking how the larger philosophical project of the less can inform his smaller yet immense work on the cinema by looking at this category of intensity. We should always remember that in almost Every single book that you look at written by the less, there's always this underlying process where his ideas are formed. And you have this almost like set of contraries between becoming, which he's favoring over being, or molecular assemblages over molar formations, the nomadic or the smooth space, which is in opposition to the sedentary or streeted state, right? The concept of intensity is doing the same job, if you like, right? It's like a category that undergoes a constant change. And so it is the name of that kind of underlying process of vari variation. So if we go back to that extensive, intensive sort of polarity, it, it, is, it is precisely this force, this imperceptible affect, which gives rise to act actual reality. and allow us to perceive images as such. You could even talk about the intensive image in terms of a quasi-concept, if we follow the less lexical, or mm. I think I call it an embryonic image as well, in the sense that, you know, the meanings or operations of this image are always very unstable. They are always subjected to variability. It's always kind of flowing, if you like. And so you cannot quite secure this force of intensity in actual images or in a system of capture that any conceptual category implicates. So even by establishing a, an image called the intensive is already kind of opposing the idea of intensity as such. There cannot be an intensive concept in a way. I don't know if you if you right. follow me in terms of like the contradiction between images and intensities passing underneath these images. That kind of reminds me of some of the arguments of difference of repetition about there's a way in which in the history of philosophy, you can see that at best there was an introduction of difference into the concept, but the elaboration of a concept of difference as such was always met with some sort of failure, if you will, either, you know, resemblance, opposition, contradiction, analogy. There was always some sort of means of re-establishing a kind of if you will yeah. hierarchy based on identity etc negation all of the those different operators and so we can see i mean this is kind of what i was thinking about when coop brought up russian arc you know because yeah. at the end of cinema two right before the last page which announces 
there's a point at which we have to stop asking what is cinema and start asking what is philosophy. Exactly. That page, yeah. the page before it, the penultimate page where he yeah. talks about the op sign and the son sign, right? So like kind of the pure visual sign, the pure sonic sign. And he's thinking about them being taken to a certain limit that reminds one of difference of repetition where it starts with this violence mm. of the sentiendum, right? The pure sentiendum that kind of forces the senses to be taken to the limit. And then all the way down the different um, faculties to the cogitandum, right? Which forces thinking. And so there's something similar going on too, where one can think if the Russian arc in its one long shot can be a part of this argument you're making about the intensive image and mm -hmm. disestablishing those demarcations Deleuze is trying to make, where I was thinking that perhaps it takes the notion of the shot itself to a certain limit. We could think yeah. ad absurdum, but I think that's part of the irrationality of the cuts of the time image itself. And I think also the the very notion of rationality being inherent to the movement image already implies the intensive is subordinated, that we are focusing on the extensive realm and the representative realm and the symbolic, et cetera. And I think that you're trying to point out very clearly that even if the Liz here and there is like, well, there are some exceptions to my historical thesis. I think he brings yeah. up like the Japanese um, director, Ozu, some others, yeah. but you you brought up more. And so yeah. that adds extra weight on maybe it's this question of a tendency in the dominant mode of cinematic films that we have from these periods that we can then the 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 thesis, the historicist thesis and the conceptual thesis isn't as stark of a contrast. And I think that's part of kind of what you're getting at. And so it is interesting that along with that thesis of the intensive image, it's also this kind of secondary, perhaps more scholarly question of what was it that prevented Deleuze, as you said, right. from elaborating intensity much right. more directly in, in the books. And I mean, all I can wonder is, you provide a lot of evidence for it, right? Where you, you mentioned that interview where they do seem to oppose intensity in the image, but you're right. There is, on the other hand, there is something where it is about, there is a difference between images that are already pre-packed with meaning that we are interpreting as kind of centered in as the eye with common sense and good sense providing the direction and the orthodoxy of how to read where it's already pre-given. But that's also too where he's thinking about this kind of violence that well, what else can you call but intensity where there's a new, what he's called the lecto sign. There's this new sign of legibility that isn't, let's say, intuitive in a, in a broad sense, right? That isn't already pre-given the rules for interpreting. Exactly. Yeah. And even the notion of as you were saying about narrative, even the notion of foregrounding interpretation as something obvious or pre-given already is to fall into this representative dogmatic image of thought that everyone already knows what it means to think, right? And I think that it's kind of like everybody already knows what it, what cinema is doing and what it means to watch a movie. And yet that's obviously yeah. not the case. And so even if there are these tendencies and we can follow Dulles on that, I think that you provide a pretty good argument that the intensive image cuts across that division. Mm -hmm. If not, it doesn't necessarily negate it, but it undermines it. Exactly. I mean, again, it's not, yeah. it's not being anti delesian but actually you know, <laughs> like funding that taxonomy mm -hmm. by way of reduction as well, you know, because I'm just talking about one image and the less is like a monster of creativity and productivity as well, but he creates so many type of images that is really difficult to cope with, right? Uh, and he also creates like a, a toolbox of concepts and categories, not just in the cinema book, which is something that I really like about the, the, the cinema book, the amount of different like, you know, concepts, but also in his other works, right? And you're right when you say, you know, like there is this always tension 
we could think of the virtual and the actual, which is, you know, a very important Deleuzean uh, distinction. And I thought about writing actually about the virtual image, but there are so many people who's already written on the virtual image. And, and of course, the connection is clear because, you know, virtuality or the virtual belongs to the realm of, of philosophy, of thought, whereas the image is more about matter and the arts, right? And then I, I think, well, so what's going to be the case of intensity as opposed to, I guess, the virtual? That's something that Masumi has worked on uh, mm -hmm. quite extensively, right? And Elizabeth Gross as well. But the idea, and this is something that is brought in what is philosophy, again, the relationship between the intensive and the virtual. And here's when we need to demarcate the two realms, right, uh, or the two categories, because intensive intensity is defined there as the plane of composition of artistic sensation, whereas the virtual is defined as the plane of immanence, and that belongs to the idea of conceptual thought. So kind of the question is, therefore, if we talk about a system that is double, as in the Lesses film philosophical taxonomy, then is precisely that kind of merging between the intensive virtual that what generates his readings of these images that are able to think in themselves. And so I guess that's the importance of intensity to me, at least. The fact that they are associated with the percepts and affects of the work of art. The Les calls this the being of sensation. And the virtual, on the other hand, is associated with the idea of the philosopher or what he calls this conceptual personae. And he says something beautiful there, uh, which is thinkers need intensity in order to think. The conceptual persona is someone who lives intensively within the thinker that forces her or him to think. And so that is precisely what the intensive image is aiming to do. As they say in that book, if art is kind of concerned with making perceptible the hidden realm of the intensive, then it is philosophy what makes the virtual kind of intelligible. And so it is also the image in terms of extensity or qualified images that make manifest the realm of the intensive. And if there is one, one thinker there that is key to my investigation is Manuel de Landa, and especially his book on intensive science and virtual philosophy. I mean, that would be a terrific contemporary thinker to interview as well. I think he will be more than willing to join you for the podcast. But I don't know if you read that book, but it's called the intensive science and virtual philosophy. So precisely making that distinction between uh, the realm of the intensive and the virtual. But he does it from this notion, I mean, from a branch of physics that is called thermodynamics. And that's where I also take the importance or the force of the intensive category. And, you know, like he follows a very basic textbook definition, but we could say that thermodynamic properties can be divided into two different two general classes, which is the intensive and the extensive. These are properties, right? And so he says something like if a quantity of matter, for example, is divided into two equal parts, you will have each part with the same value of intensive properties and the half of the values with extensive properties. So for instance, pressure, temperature, and density are examples of intensive properties. And then something like mass or total volume are examples of extensive properties. So if you have like a rule of 100 centimeters, if you cut it in, into two, you have two rules of 50 centimeters each. You know, that's a, a, a kind of an idea of the extensive. But then that is not quite the same with temperature. If you cut, you know, like a cloud, it's not that, you know, it becomes two different clouds. There is completely different transformations happening. And so I guess the point there to make is that while extensive properties, or we could say images, are divisible in a space, so when dividing an, an area into two equal parts, as I just mentioned, the intensive properties are cannot be so divided. So again, if we think of the if you divide a volume of water into two halves or two half volumes, you don't get two equal parts having the same degrees of temperature, for instance, right. right? And so I guess that's the tension between the two categories that I'm trying to develop in the book. But it is that idea of thermodynamic intensity that right. precisely help us to bring a more elastic continuity 
in the Lessig's taxonomy of images. And so we could also say that the passage from classical to modern could be connected or thought of as an incremental flow of intensities. You have the preservation of a cinematic past into the present moment, which then develop as it advances towards a future, right? This is very, very Ericksonian, I think. Uh, Elizabeth Groth writes a lot about this kind of idea of the snowball becoming bigger and bigger. But the idea of, or the understanding of this becoming of the image as the coexistence of the present and the past. So it's always about an old new sequence, you know, which is kind of entailing this elaboration of the new. There was one concept that I almost wonder if maybe Deleuze is trying to capture some of what you just went over, this difference between the extensive and the intensive. And he calls it the, uh, I know it's in Cinema 1, I'm not sure about Cinema 2, I'd have to go look. He calls it the individual, which right. isn't the indivisible or the divisible, but which doesn't divide without changing in kind. You see this again throughout his work, kind of, it's in different names and in different parts, but you'll see it in, obviously, it's a notion from... Bergson and, and Dure, right? But you see it in A Thousand Plateaus over and over. You see it in different repetition. So, you know, I wonder if that's almost his way, his stand-in for at least a little bit of this discussion of something that has the aspects right. of the intensive, this notion of the individual. I'm glad that you're picking to that one, uh, Taylor, because that, again, that's a, a concept that is really much develop. I mean, it's in the cinema books for sure, but in the seminars at the University of Vincenzo's. Okay, okay. And there is a link that you could make between the individual and this idea of the, the thermodynamic intensity in the sense mm. that if there is something proper to the intensive movement is this notion of decrease. Let's call it a multiplicity in opposition to the extensive movement, which has parts, you know, it's a unity. Right. And so... The intensive movement is not a product of an addition of parts, but a function of the individual, if you like. And I start the book in chapter one with this notion of, well, intensification mm -hmm. towards an intensification of the cinema. And I precisely use that analogy of different state of water to make that point of the differentiating image from the classical period passing through the modern to the more contemporary state. And that's what I call the solid, the liquid, and the gaseous or the vaporous image. This is precisely a type of movement of intensification that transitions from the kind of solid, icy form of classical realism that the less discuss in Cinema One to the more liquefied fluctuations of the modern age, and then kind of ending into this kind of gaseous phase of the less cinema. And the a contemporary form of realism that we would call contemplative cinema, you know, these films by Pedro Costa that I, that I was, or Bella Tars, for instance, with Southern Tango, which are, in a way, radicalizing those fragmented links of his film modernity. This is what Alain Badieu, for instance, calls the second modernity, which begins with Godard, but is intensified by Godard himself, especially towards his latest, the latest moments of his, of his career, when he becomes more of a film essayist, making philosophical indagations through film, from Histoire du Cinéma, all the way up to, you know, Adieu, Goodbye Language, and Film Socialism, and so on. So, this transition from solidity to liquid and gaseous is what kind of is unifying the spatial-temporal breaks of the last two eras by accounting by this image continuity. And so I don't know if that, that relates to specifically about to the notion of the individual, but there is something there that I, I guess catch from the, 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 the seminars that resonates in, in the book quite intensively, right? You could like easily find that in, um, yeah, as I said, you know, in Buñuel or in Berto, but um, yeah. But I do like that you brought up the contemporary because you do elaborate in your book this, you know, because I'm also glad you brought up the, uh, the, the icy, the liquid and the gaseous that that helps to visualize at least these concepts and and get a get a better grip on it. But it also you know, this notion if, and I guess this would be one of my last questions in Koopa, I, I definitely want, you know, I can leave the floor to you. I was wondering about this shift 
if the contemporary, as you put it, is meant, and you link it to the untimely in Nietzsche, which I think is great, if that is meant perhaps to call forth this and break up this duality, this dualism of the classical yeah. and the modern with what Badu may call the second modern, but this contemporary could be the designated historical epic, if you will, of the intensive image and what the future of cinema and the problems that it will encounter and unfold. Do you see something about with that elaboration of the contemporary in chapter four of your book being a, a kind of counterweight to the duality and maybe opening it up at least in a tripartite way? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, there is clearly an image that informs that notion of the contemporariness in, in philosophy. And it's not the less, but uh, Walter Benjamin's reading of the Angelus Nervus by Paul Klee, you know, this uh, monoprint from the 90s, 20s. To me, I don't know if you know what's kind of the the image that I'm talking about. The angel but of history or? Exactly, the angel of okay. history. And, you know, that idea of, or in, at least in, in Benjamin's reading, as a face that is looking backward and forthward at the same time, you know? And that's the idea of the contemporary. But you right. define, for instance, Plato as our contemporary. So it doesn't have to do with what is happening right here, right now, in the present moment, right? The terrible, you know, wars that we are experiencing right now. But it's more about what is still being discuss alive as the work of Plato, Aristotle, they all would become contemporaries in Badiou's definition. The same could be said about a classic. A classic is something that never, never dies. It's something that remains present. And so the movement of intensity is definitely informed by that vocation, really, an image that is constantly looking bad work, or, I mean, or is its realization is because of what's being done, uh, but also paving the way for something unknown and new uh, and different, right? We could say that there are like two key movements there present in, in the intensive image, which has to do with the contemporary. The first one is that intensities are thought as this continuous dynamism of flow rather than ready-made images, if you like. It is something that is constantly being transformed within itself, just the way that we are constantly transforming the thought of, uh, you know, Aristotle or Heidegger or you name it. That's the line of the problematic. And so it is precisely that intensity which is animating thinkers to think on the one hand, but also actual forms to obtain specific bodies, but also to change in themselves is kind of the energy that is moving the cinema constantly in different states of itself and so on and so forth. The contemporary becomes almost like this transhistorical category that is joining the works of, I don't know, Luis Buñuel, for instance, with, you can think of The Lobster by Yorgos Lanthimos, a more recent uh, film, and the final sequence when David, one of the protagonists, is about to cut his eyes with a steak knife, kind of mimics that early image of Buñuel in Un Chien Le, where actually it's Buñuel playing the character, the, the mad lover, the bloody lover, who is about to cut the eye of his fiancé. Or, you know, between Martel, Lucretia Martel, and Luis Buñuel, Simon of the Desert, or between these two, these three different filmmakers, how non-human animals are populating the craft of Martel, of Yorgos Lanthimos and Buñuel, and so on. So there are many, many different ways to think about the contemporary in that, in that sense. But, and kind of to conclude, I guess, uh, this, this lovely uh, interview is to say that the intensive image on the one hand, intensifies, but it's also an image that has to do with embryology rather than morphology, if you like. As I said before, it's an embryonic image or a quasi-concept, and that can be experienced in classical and modern films and contemporary, I mean, like mm. current films, let's say, not to confuse the concepts. But like, it has to be defined as like, as something that is more than the, the representation of itself, you know, as something that is always becoming or open at least to become something else and to further kind of 
or to increase the complexity of this system that we call the cinema. If we say that intensity is kind of dif- is this idea of difference, and difference is what goes underneath the given or unnoticed at least, then what I'm trying to argue there is that there are always interruptions or singular like disparities in each of the cinema's periods that match this prenatal strength of intensity. And this has to do with the notion of the incommensurable, something that goes beyond measure. Of course, I'm not saying that you have the same amount of intensive images in classical cinema than you have in modern cinema and current cinema. It's like a nomad, let's say a healthy nomad, mm-hmm. or Laura, Laura U. Marx, that grows and intensifies and get more and more and more complex. But that doesn't mean that the kind of monad begins with after the Second World War. This world has always been in pain, in, you know, like in misery. Buñuel himself experienced that in Spain. And therefore, using the Second World War as the rupture between one image and the other, to me, is very Eurocentric, to say the least. But yeah, I guess like the vision was also limited at the time to what was happening there. But, you know, if we link the time image and therefore intensity with the experience of of terror, of the war, then, you know, it precedes the cinema, if you like, you know, it's always been there. So, yeah, that's, I guess, pretty much the main the main intervention that I'm trying to yeah, make in the book. And I'm actually now going to the, the rally for, for Palestine uh, in Melbourne, which is going to be massive. Talking of terror, I guess. We want to let you get to that. Coop, did you want to say anything? No, I think we can wrap up. I don't, we usually like to capitulate by, you know, if you have any forthcoming work or projects that you're working on that you'd want to maybe tease or talk about, or, you know, potentially for, you know, we'd love to have you back as well in the future at at some point. I'm sure we could talk another three or four hours about this book, uh, but we don't want to take up that time. We definitely would love to have you back. So if you have anything that's on the, on the boiler, so to speak, please feel free to, you know, discuss anything you like. Thanks so much, Taylor and Cooper, for for inviting me to talk. It's been a wonderful conversation. And I hope that we get to meet in person, who knows where, in <laughs> Melbourne or Santiago. Yeah. Or... <laughs> Thanks again for that. And I'm actually, yeah, working on a new book. It's early, early stages, I guess. And it has a very Deleuzean vocation in the sense of creating new concepts. I'm trying Great. to bring up a new concept to think about contemporary Latin American cinema, okay. and it's called Mestizo Cinema. And Mestizaje is a very contentious historical category because it's usually mm-hmm. linked to colonialism right. uh, and this idea of the unified nation by negating the racial difference of the country. But I guess it is through the work of uh, someone like Gloria Ansaldúa from Mexico or Chicana writer among other sort of eco-feminist and post-structuralist thinkers that I'm bringing that notion of mestizaje, which means literally mixed races, to think about the heterogeneity and the impurity of cinema in relation to the other arts, for instance, you know, like cinema being the seventh art that appears after the previous six and, and therefore taking all of those resources in itself. But also to think about mestizaje as a kind of intertextual, intercultural mm. practice that is predominant in what I see some contemporary filmmakers. Uh, so I look at someone like it's Night in America and Night in America by Ana Vaz, who is an experimental filmmaker from Brazil, but also at Raul Ruiz and Valeria Sarmiento, uh, Lucrecia Martel, Carlos Reigada, you know, all films that I would recommend people interested in, in cinema and filmmakers to watch. So, yeah, that's pretty much what I'm what I'm doing now. So hoping to publish it, I don't know, in a few years time. <laughs> we did get a, a sense of at least some of where this could lead. I, was it chapter five where you go through Zaman and Martel? We get a sense of that's, what is to yeah, come. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I guess, yeah, you know, Duchamp used to paint over his own paintings. And at the end of the day, you know, the work of, in that case, of an artist is is about redoing the same the same work. Uh, there is kind of a unity within this heterogeneity that is mm-hmm. very interesting. And yet that's something that you definitely find in the less as well. So yeah. we'll see well, what comes out of that experience. Yeah. 
Cristobal, Coop and I are going to stay on just to talk about our episode tomorrow, but this will probably be out in two weeks. We'll be in touch and we want to let you go to attend the rally. And I just really want to thank you for spending your time and putting a lot of thought into uh, yeah, giving us all of the fruits of your labor. So, um, <laughs> and I'm with Coop that we'd love to have you back to talk more about, could just be about Deleuze in general, or, you know, some of your other essays. I was reading your essay on Hitchcock and Simulacra. Uh, Ooh, the other that sounds day. good. There's plenty more to do, but I want to thank you for spending your Sunday morning with us and likewise, let likewise. you get, let you get back to your day. Beautiful. Thank you so much, guys. All the thank best. You, Christopher. Thank you. All right. Bye. We'll be in touch. Bye. Bye. Peace. Thanks again to Cristobal Escobar for joining Taylor and I on this week's edition of the Machinique Unconscious Happy Hour. The very rules of eating, of negativity and singularity, including the ultimate form of singularity, which is unconscious care. The whole state of things, the pure violence without object and all. This is a typical violence of it's violent because what happens there is a murder of the real, the vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. With nothing left but recycled, whitewashed, lobotomized people, as in a clockwork orange.